it's clear, we're all here to drive positive action and to drive real lasting change. But we're also realists. We know that if, if it was easy, it would have been done by now. We wouldn't be standing here today trying to understand what we need to do more of or less of going forwards. It's also true that if you want to drive real and lasting change over time, that you really need to understand why the problem exists in the first place and what are the, what are the issues that we need to unblock to move forwards. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to spend the next 40 minutes looking into. Uh, we're going to look into the very important aspects of two things, of myths and barriers. Myths being something imaginary or something unverifiable. And when combined with barriers being a structure that prevents or hinders actions, well, these are two things that we deeply need to understand better in order to move forwards. So with that, let's get started. Let's welcome our guests for this afternoon. And let's start with you, Christiana. Christiana Figueres, a lifelong powerhouse and change maker. Behind the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, founder of Global Optimism and co-author of an excellent book, The Future We Choose, Surviving the Climate Crisis. And Mark Carney, former Bank of England governor, soon vice chairman of Brookfields, one of the world's largest asset management companies and UN Special Envoy for Climate and Finance. And Jesper Brodeen, who we also heard from earlier today, CEO of Inca Group, covering IKEA retail and investment business and Inca centers, a shopping center business around the world. Also lead singer in a heavy metal band and my boss. I'm sure he'd say he's most fulfilling role. So, Christiana, I'll start with you today before turning over to Mark. Welcome, Christiana. Well, thank you very much, Olivia, and um, it, thank you very much for inviting me to this conversation again. Uh, I am I'm now in a wonderful tradition of joining IKEA Conversations uh, and truly congratulate not just the leadership, but the collective leadership of these uh, of these conversations. Now, you have assigned me a very difficult task because it is usually my role to be the cheerleader, to put out, uh, you know, the optimism and the reasons for hope and everything that is going well. And you've assigned me exactly the opposite, to talk about the myths and the barriers. So I love the challenge. Thank you very much. It's not something where I usually spend my thinking time on, but it is, as you said in the beginning, it's very important to not go off into la la land and assume that everything is going to change because it is the most decisive decade in the history of humankind, as you've been pointing out throughout um, the rest of the day. But we have to, as, as I think about it, we have to keep our eyes on the stars, which is the vision toward which we want to move. But we also have to keep our boots in the mud and keep them dirty. That is the contact with reality and really understanding what are the myths, what are the barriers that would want to impede us from moving forward. And it's precisely the balance between the dirty boots and the clear vision that actually propels us forward. So to get into the dirty boots, myths first. Um, and there are many myths uh, that would want to keep us where we are, but I would like to highlight three today. The first that I think is very front and center for, um, for IKEA and the universe that IKEA works in um, is that consumption is bad in and of itself. And that has been put forward, obviously, by, by many who see excess consumption. And so I think it's important to differentiate between excess and consumption. It is actually every human being's right to have a dignified and comfortable life, which means health, education, water, food, and a, di a dignified environment in which to live. It is the excess of things which is 
harmful when we go beyond what is dignified and comfortable and many people can and do. But I think you know what I mean. When we go to the ultimate excess, that is where we begin to be harmful to the entire planetary business model because then we move from our human right to dignified and comfortable life into a mentality of um, extraction. And that's where we operate in extract use and discard model, which has been the problem. That extractive model is the one that has gotten us into the situation that we're in. And so I very much applaud IKEA's commitment to move much more into the circular economy. The second myth that I wanted to share with you is, um, and one that so many people struggle with, is that decarbonization is a burden. That decarbonizing the global economy or decline and decarbonizing a corporation um, is um, is very very difficult. And in fact, there are some that would argue that it is a punishment that we have to endure or that we have to bite into because of the harm that we have done. There is slightly part of that that is true, that yes, we have to mend our ways, but more than anything, honestly, decarbonization is a huge opportunity because to work under carbon constraint, just to understand it, is a very, to use an analogy, is similar to how we're working now under travel constraint and look how much we have innovated in terms of events and in terms of communication. Constraints are always opportunities for innovation. And so when you have a carbon constraint over the entire global economy, what it is is a very rich bed for innovation and creativity. And the third myth that I wanted to help us to puncture is that sustainability is very expensive that it is actually unreachable except to those of the highest income. If that were true, we would never be able to normalize sustainability. And all of us know that we need to urgently normalize sustainability. And we also know that by and large, when we move towards sustainability, we're actually doing a lot of efficiency and a lot of savings and that it is not necessarily expensive. Yes, there are some things that are expensive, but uh, by and large, sustainability is not expensive, more expensive than what we're doing now. And it is certainly not more expensive if you take into account all of the externalities and give them a value. Then you realize that the lack of sustainability is actually the most expensive way of operating, and anyway, we have to be able to normalize. We have to be able to bring every citizen into sustainability. Um, I also wanted to talk about barriers because I think it's very easy to for those in a corporate world to look across the aisle to governments and say the governments are the ones that are the problem. They're not pushing through on their policies. Um, and, you know, if they only priced carbon, we would be able to do so much more. True. But the counter question to that is, what is the delta between where we are now and where governments, uh, governments absolutely have to put a price on carbon? It'll take a while, unfortunately, for them to put a price on carbon in most juris- jurisdictions where that doesn't exist yet. Of course, in the EU, it does exist, but in other jurisdictions, it doesn't. That's going to take a while. Our responsibility is to figure out how do we, from a bottom-up perspective, from an individual perspective, from a corporate perspective, how do we fill the delta between where we are now and where we absolutely need a price in carbon? Because the fact is that we have these myths and these barriers in our head. Why do they persist, these barriers? Well, at a systemic level, they persist because, admittedly, there are many vested interests that are still playing their part in in acting as a handbrake to the transition that we must accelerate. But at the corporate level, I would argue there are two reasons why barriers persist, and they're both mental. The first is our attachment to the past. 
We've always done it this way. And then we get attached to the past and we have a certain fear of the unknown. That attachment to the past is basically an anchor. Think of a sailboat that wants to sail off but has an anchor there. We have to pull up the anchor of our attachment to the past if we want to sail off to new waters. And the second very, um, very um, associated uh, reason why barriers persist at the corporate or at the individual level is frankly a lack of imagination about what the new future could be. We are so much better at envisioning the disasters that climate change could produce than we are at envisioning the new business models, the new way of life, the new kinds of cities, the new energy structure, the new infrastructure. Uh, we are so much uh, uh, better at envisioning the bad news than we are of envisioning what we can do. And that is why I am so delighted that IKEA is making such an effort to help everyone to envision the new future that we can create if we choose to do so. If we pull up our anchor, the attachment to the past, and are willing and bold enough and courageous enough to sail off into new and cleaner waters. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's amazing and super inspiring. Um, uh, and thank you also for joining us from Costa Rica. I, I'm super glad that the um, electricity is holding up and we're able to, to yeah. keep our connection going. So thank you so much, Christiana. And I think we can only agree to, with you that um, sustainability should not be uh, a luxury that only few people can afford. And it really must be something that we can normalize for every single citizen around the world going forward. So, so thank you for, for your words of wisdom. And then with that, I'd like to quickly turn to Mark before handing over to Jesper. Um, Mark, you're a, a longtime activist for accelerating the transition to a clean energy society, which is much needed. And that you've also said that you see that the recovery from COVID-19 could actually be an opportunity to invest in the greening of the economy going forward. So I'm super curious to hear from you what you see are some of the barriers that might persist or some of the myths in transforming our economies. And also maybe picking up, we heard her earlier today, if you were part of the conversation where Halla spoke about the time horizon perspective we should have in business moving forward, going from short termism to perhaps a longer time horizon as well. And I know you have some viewpoints on that, but I'll, I'll hand over to you, Mark, to, to take it away with what you see are the true myths or barriers going forwards to lift. Okay, Th thank you very much, Olivia. Um, I'm glad we have audio, we've got electricity, hopefully we have video uh, coming from Canada as well. Um, and um, and uh, let me salute uh, IKEA uh, and the Inva group uh, for their efforts and for this initiative. It's a pleasure to be a part of it, and it's wonderful to see Christiana. Um, I don't see enough of Christiana anymore, uh, so it's good to see her uh, and salute everything she's done. So just to, to give context, uh, the context I want to give to the question is to say there's sort of three potential barriers at the highest level, the way I look at it. Um, the first is technical or engineering barriers, if you will. Um, I'll leave those to the experts. Uh, but the way I see it is that at least out to 2030 and in, in effect beyond, but on the pathway to 2030, um, those technical barriers are not there. Um, that there is cost competitive uh, energy uh, versus the status quo. There's, there's, there's a series of efficiencies and other uh, drives that can get us on the, uh, keep us on the pathway that Christiana and others laid out uh, in effect in Paris um, for that 45% emission reduction between where we are today and where we need to get to to be on the path to uh, something consistent with one and a half degrees. Um, and this is really engineering. I mean, it's, it's, it's scale um, uh, economies as opposed to R&D. Now, again, the way I see it beyond that for certain hard to abate sectors, there are some innovations in R&D that needs to happen, but those will come as the second two barriers are addressed. And my second barrier is around politics. And in a pol political sense, I'll, I'll, I'll use a small p, um, which is around having a consensus about what does society want and having that expressed in a way that's clear enough for the market um, to get behind that and deliver. And that's where the barrier or, or the challenge turns into enormous opportunity. And I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and I will say, again, I'm going to slip into um, Christiana type uh, optimism here when you're asking about barriers, that there has been real progress um, 
It started with the SDGs that took a huge leap forward with Paris in defining what was necessary um, uh, through uh, through the innovation there, then dropped down to leading uh, companies and subnational groups um, uh, on a sectoral level to set out uh, objectives and then clearer plans to go to net zero. It doesn't cover the entire uh, economy or the entire global geography, but it's quite substantial now. It's been given a real um, reinforcement um, from the, um, this is the upside of the tragedy of, uh, of COVID, is looking back and a chance to um, take an assessment of what society's values are, um, the importance of resilience, the importance of solidarity, including intergenerational solidarity. And, and I think this will become more apparent as we move forward through this COVID crisis, the importance of dynamism, the importance of, importance of pointing the market, if I can put it that way, in the right direction, the direction that society wants, um, and then um, uh, having, uh, and this is the objective, to have a job-heavy, investment-driven, green recovery, which is what we need in order to not just build back better, um, but to, uh, to, to meet our, our, our broader our broader societal goals. So uh, if, if you're following my logic, um, on the engineering side, that barrier, there is there are still technical barriers, but they are farther out. Um, and for at least the foreseeable future, uh, there's huge, huge opportunity that leading companies and sectors can take. Um, on the political side, the consensus is forming um, and posing a direction. And so then that brings me on to my safest turf, the turf I know the most about, um, which is finance. And what about the financial barriers um, to uh, financing climate change? And five years ago, um, literally five years ago, I said that the challenge was that there was it was the tragedy of the horizon, particularly for finance. And that gets to part of your question, Olivia, which is around the, the time horizon over which uh, many financial actors look at uh, a loan or an investment um, or some other interaction with a company, which is doesn't take the risks of climate change into account because they what we do today, of course, determines what happens to uh, the climate, uh, but those actual physical risks manifest farther into the future. So how do you bring the future into the present? That's been the challenge. Part of it's through progress on the technological side, which I referenced. Very importantly is that political consensus, small p political consensus about where we want to go. So I would almost call it a societal consensus, which is coming together. Um, and then within finance, and I'll finish on this, but these, these are important you know, technical points, if I may. Um, what does finance need to do its job? And this is the agenda. This is a bit of a commercial, but this is the agenda for the private finance um, element of COP, um, which is uh, you need information, so you need reporting. And that means uh, a standard, a very high standard that's not just static reporting of GHG uh, footprints, but where it's going going forward, um, and uh, we want to make that mandatory by, uh, by uh, Glasgow in 2021. Uh, secondly, you need banks to manage their risk, not just in a traditional way, backwards looking credit risk uh, type approach, but thinking about climate risk and how climate risk changes as companies move towards net zero. And then thirdly, and very, very importantly, you need those uh, big Pension funds, asset managers, sovereign wealth funds, uh, those who invest what is ultimately our money, uh, be able to communicate to us whether those investments, those loans are consistent with what we want, going back to my small p political point, which is a transition to net zero. Um, and it's a simple question to, a to ask. It's a more challenging question to answer in a consistent way but we need to overcome that barrier. We need to uh, work, and we are obviously working with the industry so that the question can be answered. Um, is my pension fund, um, is it consistent with a transition to one and a half degrees? And if not, why not? And what's the strategy in order mm. to get it uh, in that position? Um, so all of those barriers, um, and I'll finish with this, on the financial side um, are what we're tackling so that we can get to a point in Glasgow uh, by 2021, and obviously we're, we're building to that over time. We're not going to you know, unveil everything at the end, um, so that uh, every financial decision uh, can take climate change into account, and demonstrably so. 
and to great effect. And the more that's the case, you, you turn what is a barriers into uh, opportunities and a vicious into a virtuous cycle. And, and, and I will be, I'm, I'm infected by Christiana um, and um, I'm going to uh, end on an optimistic note because I really do think these are, these are being overcome now. Mm. Fantastic. And, and thank you so much, Mark. Um, I actually haven't felt that optimistic about the financial sector in quite some time. So I'm super glad that you are where you are and um, and that um, it also feels empowering as well, your message on us as, as the many people also asking questions to our pension fund owners as well um, on how the money is allocated going forward. So big thank you and, and fantastic to have you with us today. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over now to Jesper um, and uh, welcome Jesper. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to reflect a little bit on what we've heard from both um, Mark and Christiana, super inspiring, and, and, and what you see from, from where you stand also as a, as a father and as a business leader, uh, and what the barriers are um, going forwards. But, but hmm. maybe first, yes, but we could start with the myths as you see them. Well, I'm, I'm actually going to surprise you, I think, because I thought as I listened to uh, uh, here to Mark and Christiana that one of the barriers uh, possibly in society today is the distance between us. Uh, all these people, the many people who are, are frustrated, afraid of the future. And here we have leaders as you, Christiana and Mark, uh, uh, not only representing hope, but actually being already capable to move massive uh, objectives like the Paris Agreement, Christian, and, and uh, the whole view on stranded asset uh, um, that you brought, uh, I think, to the surface uh, uh, for the first time, Mark, as well. So the communication is maybe a barrier. But if you look at the myths, um, I was just nodding here listening uh, to Christiana be, um, introducing, uh, I think, the three myths that I and we spend a bit of time on. On one hand, to try to eradicate the myth that purpose and profit uh, does not go hand in hand, which is wrong. Um, secondly, I would say the myth that uh, sustainability should come at the premium, which is a very, very dangerous approach, is the easy way and it's going to delay us massively. Um, and it also ties to what Mark has talked about, because the barrier in itself is investments. And let me come back to that. But the third myth um, is about consumption. And here I would even add to what Christiana said that sometimes you even use the word mass consumption and mass production as something negative, which of course it could be and has been maybe in the past. But in order to scale good, mass is something fantastic. So to scale innovation, scale uh, renewable, uh, the, the element of mass both in production and in consumption will be very important for us. And as such, I think the important thing is to say there is, of course, bad consumption, but how do we drive sustainable consumption? This is going to be an important part uh, for the whole equation going forward. And maybe let me finish uh, to say that I, I believe, uh, reflecting on the conversation, that investments in itself is an even more important barrier to discuss than uh, taxes. I think uh, companies like ourselves and most companies out there are aware, are ready to move. And there are a couple of aspects where I think it's not a matter of if we will do it, but when. So how to create incitaments for the big investments so we can scale change. And how to make sure that we all invest in the future uh, and not in the past. That will be uh, important. And as such, I hope uh, Mark and Christiana that together and together with Alan and Juni and many others that we can come together and make sure that we incentivize that future and speed up some of the investments that we are ready to make. Fantastic. And actually, speaking of investments, Jesper, you've also just reminded me on something that you committed to, which um, we're speaking about today as well. I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more on the investments that you have chosen to, to stand behind for um, a greener future. Absolutely. I, I think it's, uh, on one hand, maybe you could see it as a drop in the ocean, but uh, I think it has both symbolic and actually monetary value. So at this point um, in the group, we have invested about 3.2 billion euro into uh, sustainability. And mind you, th these are good investments when it comes to profitability, long-termness in our business models, relating to renewable energy, forestry, or even acquisitions of companies that support us in this uh, transition. And now we have decided to almost double the speed for the coming 12 months with adding another 600 million euro into those investments. So that's the news from our side for today. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jesper. Um, excellent. And then what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to check if um, my dear friend and colleague Daniela is with us here. Um, we're going to start to open up and bring some questions in. Um, we have uh, friends with us from LinkedIn today. We also have friends of us in the, the meeting. So hi, Daniela. Hey, Olivia. I hope you're well. Fantastic. Uh, yes, we have tons of questions. There are many questions coming in. And I think that I, I will actually start with one question that addresses all of you. There is one person who is, uh, would love to know whether the presenters feel more outraged or optimistic today. So let's go to all three of you. Maybe you can start, Christiana. Well, I'm, I'm highly grateful for the question because it clearly is someone <laughs> Who's listening to the Outrage and Optimism um, podcast? So thank you very much for that. You know, honestly, I am both. I am both at the same time. I'm outraged because I see that so much more could be done at a higher scale and at a quicker pace. Uh, and I'm outraged by the fact that what we do not do is affecting the most vulnerable populations around the world in a way that is so unjust. Um, that it's very difficult to bear that uh, lack of justice. So I am outraged. I'm also optimistic. I'm optimistic because I see so many signs of progress. I see so much commitment. I see so many, so many heads opening up, so many um, hearts opening up to the new possibilities that are emerging and that we are making emerge. If they don't emerge on their own, they definitely require intentionality. They require directionality, which is um, the dynamism that Mark was so helpfully talking about. Um, but we're we're gathering that. And honestly, I'm I'm even more optimistic today than I was when we adopted the Paris Agreement because there is more evidence of progress. Yeah, and you did an amazing job in that as well. If we go to you, Mark, how do you feel about this? Well, it's it's a it's a great question and it's a great podcast. I've been on it and I, I like to <laughs> listen to it, so I, I recommend it. The um, I have to say, if we didn't know what the carbon budget was and the timescales around that, I'd feel perfectly optimistic. The the momentum in um, finance around these issues. I mean, this is, this is going to mainstream in finance. Um, and um, all the conversations have moved out of, uh, even in the past five years, they've moved out of the sort of sustainability or corporate social responsibility arms of the financial institutions to the executive offices, right in the heart of the executive offices. And many of those individuals from those CSR areas or sustainability have moved into the mainstream of those uh, institutions, which is very positive, and this is becoming a real business opportunity, a profit opportunity, as well as a purpose. Uh, again, going back to what Jesper was saying is his first myth, which is absolutely right. So uh, I, I feel very um, you know, optimistic about that in the direction of travel. Where the outrage comes from is just the realities of the, uh, the realities of the carbon budget and, uh, and the timescales here, um, and the need to scale and scale rapidly. Um, I do feel that the, um, this is a moment for more optimism, at least in my world, uh, the world I spend more of my time in, in terms of encouraging uh, and reinforcing these trends um, and the positive opportunities from it, uh, you know, sort of the carrot as opposed to the stick at this point because, uh, because of that momentum. So you need both. Um, um, I will settle for the moment on the optimistic side of the equation. Uh, but we all need to be disciplined. And I, maybe I'll just, Daniel, if you could give me one last second. Part of what will happen in finance is that the, the, the system will become oriented around net zero. That's a huge accomplishment. And then it's going to get ratcheted up because it's not just net zero to scope two, it's net zero scope three. And it's not just net zero in 2050, it'll have to be net zero sooner. And then it will have to, you know, the net component will have to be reduced out of that over time. So that is how uh, we're going to really allow the optimism to squeeze out my still considerable uh, outrage. Thank you, Mark. Let's also go to you, Jesper. What do you say about this? Well, 
Now, I almost had too much time to think about this, but uh, <laughs> uh, to be honest, I, th I think um, I've been more in the outrage in the past, but I also find that uh, uh, for myself, it doesn't really move uh, me into the right place when it comes to actions. There are things about cynicism and obstruction to this agenda that would uh, uh, make me um, outraged. But I, I would say uh, optimism is my way pa uh, forward, and I think that is actually not only as I had the opportunity to share this morning as well or before lunch, I think there are evidence all around us now and we need to pick up. And I've been through a couple of changes before when you can sense the momentum. And I think we are into that momentum now. So therefore I would say I would bring 100% uh, optimism and 10% outrage as we go ahead, which shows a really bad mathematics here, uh, by the way. <laughs> So if we, uh, if we just continue with uh, some other questions, there are very many questions coming in. So I'm, I, I might ask you as uh, speakers and presenters to be quite short in your response so that we can at least answer some of the questions. I think I will go to you, Christiana. Uh, what is the hardest barrier to overcome, to overcome these challenges, do you think? That was, that was a hard question, I'm sorry. <laughs> And I honestly think the hardest barrier is in our mind. If we convince ourselves that this is impossible, we will make it impossible. If we gather the conviction that together, because it has to be collective, that we can bring all of our creativity, our ingenuity, our innovation capacity, and our determination to actually make the solutions possible in time and at scale, we can do it. Honestly, for me, the biggest barrier is our mind. I, I truly believe that as well. And uh, Mark, if we can build on what Christiana just said, if there are so many of us that care about this issue, why aren't we moving faster? I think that, um, I think finance is part of that. And I think it goes back to that third point I tried to make at the start, which is, um, and you picked up on Danielle this this need to uh, understand how our money is being used with respect to climate, and to make that very simple: is it on the right or wrong side of history? Is it consistent with a move to net zero or not? And how how does it have to move in order to do that? And so we need to we need to uh, distill that down to a simple answer. Thank you. And Jesper, uh, what would you say is IKEA's strategy from stopping the use of plastics, glues in your products? That was a very specific question. Thank you for that. So basically, uh, we have two views on plastic. The first one is that we have already started to eliminate that. I think we're actually done with the single-use plastic, which is uh, something that we should rid the planet of. Um, the second would be that we are looking into plastic. The good sides of plastic would be when you can have recycled plastic that is actually a phenomenal material that is long lasting, possible to reuse, etc. So if you create the circle loops around uh, uh, plastic, it's, um, it's, um, it's a good material. Um, and maybe the third part, which I'm not fully updated on, but I know that there is a lot of progress within IKEA and other uh, companies as well, is also to look at alternative materials uh, for different users. And there is some, I think, optimism also there in the coming 10 years uh, period. Thank you. And uh, we have one more for you, Jesper, which is a bit more high level. What mindset do we need in the business to make positive decisions for people and planet? Well, I think uh, Christiana said it. The, the difficulty in innovation and development and creativity is such is that you argue on one hand on the past with the known facts towards the future where you might have uh, intuition or uh, aspirations. And sometimes um, the uh, facts of the past are very strong and very hard to argue against. And the component of faith and uh, trusting that we will figure out the answers I think is one of the most important things here. And it's also why I'm optimistic, because I see uh, companies, leaders, in also, very, in also businesses that have huge challenges, uh, start to take that uh, leap of faith and commit. Because in the end of the day, back to the barriers, I think the entry ticket in order to be part of co-creating the future we want to see is to commit to Paris 
and to commit to disclosure. That's not going to in itself solve anything, but that is the entry ticket that we will need to pass. Thank you so much, uh, Jesper. And I think that uh, now it's your turn to take this over, Olivia. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, what a fantastic session. We've heard um, so much in the last 40 minutes. I think I'm going to need to rewatch this a few times and then take even more notes. But we've heard about really landing on maybe a new narrative or the way that we talk about consumption moving forwards to, to shifting more to the right kind of consumption for a dignified right, for a dignified life, um, hearing from Christiana today. Um, also, the, the need for us to shift to seeing our biggest problems as our biggest opportunities, all, all three speakers commenting on that. The importance, as you were saying, Jesper, to commit and to disclose, as well as using our power as citizens uh, to direct the markets and to really put much more requirements on where our money goes and how it is spent throughout the entirety of our lives going forwards was a super empowering message. And that we can and both perhaps should be equally, if not maybe slightly less outraged and, and more optimistic, but it's okay to be both. And that the most important thing is that we act. Um, we take the hope, we take the optimism and we act because doing nothing is not an option. So thank you so much to all of our speakers today. And thank you so much for following us on LinkedIn and here in the studio.